Thank you. Thank you for joining us this evening for a wonderful talk by author Margie Ruddick, the author of Wild by Design. Tonight's program is brought to you by the Barat Memorial Library Association in partnership with the Garden Club of Old Greenwich. This is our third year of our partnership offering interesting programs of interest to our community. It's my pleasure to introduce tonight, Diane Fox, who's the chairman of the Conservation and Environment Committee of the Garden Club of Old Greenwich to introduce our author. Diane, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Um, I just wanna say thank you very much, everyone joining us tonight. And I'm sure this will be a very interesting and exciting program. It, our club, the Garden Club of Old Greenwich is 93 years old, and we have many different projects in, uh, currently. Of, of course, most people know that the Garden Club uh, actually does the planters in the Old Greenwich Business District for seasons as they change. We'll be doing the Christmas stuff pretty soon. Uh, we've also had the bulb sale, the plant sale, annual plant sale, which is a big success. And we also have distributed 150 white pine seedlings to the children at the Old Granite School kindergarten and second grade. Uh, horticulture is a big issue with us and our bulb sale, um, I hope everybody's bought bulbs, uh, is gonna be bulb pickup day on October 26th. So the club is very involved and we really appreciate the partnership with the Parat Library and Kevin to bring these programs to you. Um, today, our speaker is Margie Ruddick and she is a landscape architect and she has her own business. And let me just give you a little bit of her background. Um, she has been in the business for many, many years, but um, for over 20 years, actually. She was recognized for her pioneering work in landscape design, a winner of the Cooper Hewitt National Design Award in Landscape Architecture. She has actually done urban projects, the Queens Plaza in New York, the South Point Park in Roosevelt Island, the Bryant Park in New York, international projects in China and India. So she has developed uh, as an innovative and pragmatic practice, um, both buildable and economically feasible landscape designs, which is what I think all of us really want, especially here in Greenwich. Um, she's an advocate for the wild landscape movement. And this is why we asked her to come today uh, because she balances ecological conservation and restoration with the sense of design and art. And that's, I think, a great combination we want to hear about today. Uh, her book, Wild by Design, Strategies for Creating Life-Enhancing Landscapes, and she will talk about some of her personal work and uh, her projects that she has done. She's involved in some new projects as well. She urges designers, and I love this quote, to look beyond the rules often imposed by both landscaping convention and sustainability checklists. She looks for more creative and intuitive approaches and and believing that you can have high level landscape with art. She also, um, we were discussing this before, pollinators. Uh, those are important, the native and some non-native species. She lives in Sleepy Hollow. So she is a local, as we would say. Mm -hmm. And I look forward to hearing her talk today as many of you will also, and we'll learn more things as we go along. Uh, Margie, we appreciate you being here. And with, without further ado, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, thank you so much. And um, I'm going to open and go. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I, I do feel local. My office is in White Plains. I'm sort of in the region quite a bit. But it was also really interesting being invited because I did a little bit of a little bit of looking around in, in the landscape around Greenwich, um, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, this is actually my native landscape, the end of Long Island, the sort of coastal wash beyond the Hamptons. Um, but I also was uh, brought up, my, that's my mother, the little yellow stripe, who is an artist and a designer with Noel. This was a photograph in 1950 of her with uh, Noguchi and um, Nakashima and others. And so there was no real, in our, in our family, there was no real division between design and nature and art 
and you know these sort of wild landscapes and I think that's something that uh, very much I just grew up with not thinking of them as as separate um, but when I went to the graduate school of design at Harvard um, I found out that they were very separate there um, I had worked for several years at the Central Park Conservancy and also the Natural Resources Group doing uh, mapping the wetlands and woodlands of New York and, and meadows. And uh, when I went to the GSD, I found out that um, there were these strict divisions between the quote designers and the quote ecologists. And that was something that I just didn't really understand. And it took me about 20 years um, when Queens Plaza was done in, in 2012. It had been almost 20 years since I uh, graduated. I apologize, I have a cold. So I, if I sound a little funny, um, it had been 20 years since I graduated from graduate school, and the world had kind of caught up to this idea that you can have something that's very uh, clearly architectural, that's very urban, but that also has a uh, life to it, that also is um, operating as a, as a kind of an ecosystem. So Queens Plaza was the first project I felt that really got a lot of recognition for doing that. Um, uh, but I'm going to talk a little bit about something that I do on... on um, all of our projects, which is uh, to really look, I think when you're talking about wild landscapes, you know, people can just think about sort of ecologies, but you you really need to think about what is the landscape, what is it? Um, and with Queens Plaza, uh, it was very clear that it needed, this was what it looked like beforehand. It needed to be, it was just acres of paving. It needed to be a refuge. Um, and Amanda Burden, who was the head of plant, city planning at the time, said, we need this to be a green refuge. Uh, so that was mar that those were our marching orders. Uh, and then on each project, I'm going to show you, I'm going to talk a little bit about that sort of um, idea of what is it. And with my own, um, my own house in Philadelphia, where I lived from 2004 to 2015, um, we were talking, Diane and Kevin, and and um, we were talking about uh, the fact that I got a summons for growing weeds in my front yard because I didn't know what I was going to do there. Um, I had a third, this was the, um, I had a third of an acre of just lawn. It had a chem lawn sign and um, I didn't really want to design a landscape. Um, I did a big renovation of the house and I just thought, I, I don't, I don't want to um, live in a place that I've designed and, and sort of have that in my consciousness. And so I just made an experiment in reforestation. And I just started a, a mowing plan and I decided to um, just mow the areas that I needed. Uh, this was it in year zero on the left-hand side and this was about year three. So I let the front go. I just mowed the paths and then the areas in the back where we were really gonna be living, living space. And so it started to succeed with, um, a lot of uh, first black cherries, you know, the sort of successional species and then oaks. And by the time I left, there were about 20 uh, red oaks and others um, that had actually uh, really taken root and, and really it was becoming a forest. Um, and in doing these landscapes, uh, maybe this is just my habit, but um, I'm always kind of towing the line between order like the domestic world and you know clean lines and things and the sort of chaos that it seems like chaos like this was actually all stone that we had dug up to um make a dry garden on um the side of the driveway and it's was a hick and schist i don't know if you all know about that but it's a really amazing um metamorphic stone and i just had these guys who were helping me put them on this concrete pad in the back that i didn't know what to do with as well and this crack formed and that became this little river of violets and eventually um, um, eventually uh, some um, flowering trees, a cherry. And uh, uh, there were, you know, it was amazing to see this happen and to watch it happen. So sort of towing that fine line between letting things go and then really managing things. Um, so what I did was to coppice all of the black cherries so that they wouldn't get my neighbors really mad because they are so invasive. Um, so I would just cut them down before they went to seed. Um, I would underplant, uh, just thin out things that I didn't want to grow there. So this is year four. It looked pretty terrible. That was probably right about the time that I got the summons. Um, and then year seven, it really started 
to be its own thing and started to grow into a forest. And this is, you know, it, we, I did the metrics on it. We sequestered five tons of carbon per year, just by sh shifting from lawn to forest. Um, you know, you can um, do your, do the math uh, and the amount of what, which is actually not that much. Cause I was flying a lot at the time. So I was like, I'm not offsetting my flying by <laughs> doing this. However, the amount of water um, was like one, 20 by 40 swimming pool that's retained every year. And that's pretty significant. So if you imagine that there are 10 people on my block and we all do this, that's a lot of water that you're actually retaining and not sending into the sewer system and also into the streams that are very challenged. Um, so one of the things when you are doing a landscape that, um, hold on one second, I'm I'm gonna let my dog out. I I apologize, I'm working from home and I said that I had to let him in, now I have to let him out because he's making this up. Um, if I may, while uh, Margie is uh, getting the dog, uh, those of you who may have questions, if you would jot those questions down in the chat room, I will read them at the end of the uh, her, her views. Okay, thank you. So um, one of the things you have to, when you want a landscape that is, you know, a living thing, um, you have to allow for the amount of mess. And we were talking about this before also, how if you just let your the front of your house go, uh, it can look pretty messy. And how do you manage that so that it actually allows for the amount of life you want, but it also kind of creates a place with a certain kind of order to it. So that's always a big job. So what I did was I mowed exactly how much space we wanted as a living space. Um, and then I let the rest go. And this in the back is my little pokeweed garden. I, I ended up loving pokeweed, um, which is a native plant. Um, so allowing some of the, what you think of as weed species to come in. And the other thing is just, we had a ton of milkweed and other uh, very beneficial plants. Um, this is a little bit of, um, of uh, karma because when I used to do this sort of fancy houses in the Hamptons, um, I would always have this issue of somebody would want a weeping cherry and I would, they'd say, where does my weeping cherry go? And I would all say, you know, um, I don't know where the weeping cherry goes. And so I had a weeping cherry seed in on my driveway right here. And I thought it was a regular ornamental cherry and it started to bend over and I ended up loving it and I underplanted it with asters. But one of the things you can do is just, and um, uh, Joan Nassauer is a um, professor at Michigan, I think, and she has written about um, how you can kind of frame these wild landscapes and create very tidy margins so they seem intentional. And that's something that we really have uh, done a lot so that it doesn't all look like an abandoned place um, for the neighbors. Uh, and the neighbors were a little taken aback for a while, but then once it really started to grow in and they actually started to pick the dewberries or the wine berries or whatever you call them that were growing on the edge of the um, near the cherries, they, they liked it. So, but this project, you know, over a 10 year period really emboldened me to, to wait and not to be so quick. We talk now to clients a lot about phasing things over three, five years, uh, because it's, uh, I, uh, those of you who are gardeners know that, you know, it takes a long time to establish a garden and you have to do a lot of, it's not just that things take a long time to grow, but you have to do a lot of art direction, move things around and just let things settle in. So it really is a process of kind of letting things happen. Um, like this is the little river of, of weedy species um, and then really managing it because uh, you know, you know if you just let it all go, you, you would end up kind of with um, a kind of brambly tangle in this area of, of Philadelphia. Um, so this was year eight, and this is all of the uh, milkweed that just seeded into the vegetable garden in the front. And I just, you know, and the pokeweed. And I did have a vegetable garden and I put um, flowers and things. And it was it was amazing how it felt. It felt so different uh, from year one or year zero to year nine or 10 when I moved back home. And then I went back last year, year 17, and it was bought by somebody who really loved the landscape and who's been managing it as a forest in the front and then a garden in the back. And I also, you know, so this is sort of the what is it, I, I ended up realizing that it was a forest after I didn't know what to do with it. 
but I did mention the whole issue of, of life in the landscape. And um, this was a quote from something at Yale. I was um, giving a talk and reading through their materials. And it said, landscape is a medium of design for the social, cultural, and ecological life of the city. And I really feel like, um, you know, the whole idea of wild landscapes, whether they're urban, whether they're in your house landscape, it really is about living in a place that is alive, that's full of life. And how do you do that? And how do you maintain that? Uh, sometimes, you know, we're going to do a whole, we rarely do a whole new landscape from scratch in a public project. This is Queens Plaza. So a lot of times it's kind of surgical insertion of native plants or of whether you're talking about pollinator gardens or forest. Um, but in terms of this public project, it really was very surgical, just inserting these ribbons of um, vegetation into this pretty prohibitive place. And then also layering things. And this is true no matter the scale. Um, you know, multi-purposing, having things have multiple purposes is really, really useful in giving a place a lot of life because if people are using it not just um, for one thing, but a lot of people are using it, like um, for instance, in a garden that somebody is actually uh, gardening for food and somebody actually is using it as a place to read and somebody's actually using it as a place to play we're often trying to um, thread all of these different kinds of program into any project. So in doing that, we also try to make a kind of a seamlessness between inside and out. And that's just my, there are people who design gardens and you walk into it and it's like nothing around it and it's supposed to be like that and it's amazing. And that's just not my um, kind of tendency, um, but it's, um, in the case of Queens Plaza, we really didn't have a site where you kind of, you, you, we really wanted to connect it to, for instance, using the striping from the Department of Transportation to go into the site so that you didn't have a feeling like now we're in a new landscape and now we're outside of it. And that we do that very often in residential projects as well, how to fit them within the larger framework of the ecosystems around them, um, whatever the larger landscape is. Um, this is a project I did with Stephen Harris, an architect I've worked with a lot, that um, is one of the eight places in the world where the desert meets the sea. And this, uh, it's in Cabo in uh, Baja, California. And this, uh, I very much wanted to make this be, it was finished in 2002 when developers were still, or, you know, homeowners were still doing the irrigate the whole place and plant, you know, palm trees. And I wanted to do a real desert landscape. Uh, so it was actually very challenging. It was an amazing project to work on, but how to make it seamless so that inside and outside. So this is, um, you know, outside of the property and it would just flow in and feel as if you're in the larger desert. And that actually took, it was so interesting to me about how people were using desert plants down there at the time. You would see people using desert plants, but first of all, they were mulching them which basically takes out one of the really uh, active layers in terms of where insects and um, snakes and other creatures live. But the other thing is that they were using them in a way that was almost like English landscape gardening. So if you look at, I just took this and, and did a little diagram. So, you know, this is sort of English style using these agave in these big drifts. And so what I did with the local um, landscape contractor is went out into the desert and we actually mapped how plants occur in the desert and just observed and then tried to do that in this landscape. And so it feels, and within a week of the planting, my client called me up and said that there were Orioles that had flown in and were nesting. And it, it really created a habitat that was very, very rich, very, very quickly. And it's still now uh, 20 years on. And, you know, just doing things like rather than thinking of green roof, uh, this is actually occupied space below and it's a brown roof. It's a green roof, but it's using desert plants. So how do you actually, uh, I'm admitting somebody into the, <laughs> how do you actually, um, how do you actually use the desert idiom sort of uh, in, in every place that you're working with? So uh, and this is also the brown roof and that's the occupied space below. Um, but something that I 
you may not think is really at work in all these projects. I, I think that Diane was talking about the art part. It's it's the the kind of sequencing, the procession through these spaces and how do they kind of connect you with the larger landscape. And that, I think I learned a lot <laughs> working in Central Park on sort of Olmstead, Olmstead's uh, way of taking you through places into these enclosed spaces and then out into a larger landscape. And it's very effective to also connect you to the bigger landscape. So this is looking down onto the courtyard and then you come through underneath this roof and you see the sea through this more composed landscape that when you actually turn internally is really a composition. So it's not all native plants. That's a washi tree, which is not native, but it's used in the markets around there. So, um, and, but then you turn back out and go to the pavilion and you kind of walk down that little sliver next to the pavilion um, in between, and you can see the pool from up there. So you walk down in between the rocks um, and this is all replanted. Um, and so this is also the kind of surgical thing that we're doing a big comp composed courtyard, but then we're kind of um, just, uh, snaking you through this much more uh, constrained landscape, and then you then it, you open out to the sea again. And I think that that's a way of kind of giving you this experience of being more inward, and then opening out and feeling the connection to the larger landscape. So here you're in between these walls, and then afterwards you're really immersed not only in the pool but also in the Pacific Ocean. And you can actually watch whales. The whales um, migrate in February and March just sitting there with your elbows on the pool. So uh, I think it's not just a trope, like an Olmsteadian trope. I think it's really a way of experiencing the landscape um, in, in a way that's very immersive, that immerses you in the sort of ecological frameworks as well as the composition of the domestic landscape. Uh, on a project out on the North Fork of Long Island, um, I was just really, really conscious that this was a bluff I don't know if you all know about the geology in Long Island, the terminal moraine, the um, Ronkonkoma formation goes all the way out to Montauk. And it makes these bluffs that are very characteristic of Long Island. Um, and there's also just a, uh, this is actually Kutchog. It actually is the place where Einstein was on the beach. Um, and it's a very mysterious kind of a landscape. And I, there's, there's a kind of a, the quality thing of how do you respond to the quality of place and make something that kind of meets it. So this, um, this is this little peninsula um, that comes off of the North Fork and the orange is all of the bluffs that are created where the um, geology actually raised up. And so you have these incredible, uh, they're vegetated cliffs. So, but you also have, incredible forests, wetlands, and beach. So it's, an, it's a really, I, I was talking a little bit about the diversity of the landscape in Greenwich. You have a similar array in Greenwich, it's pretty incredible. Um, so just understanding, but this is that bluff condition in the back there. And that that was something that um, people don't necessarily value that much, but it's a really particular ecosystem that has particular plants and animals that live there, uh, birds in particular. So this is a plan. So a lot of the plans we do are a little unconventional because um, they don't look like sort of landscapey plans. This is uh, the oak forest. We're working with uh, Lake Flato, the architects. This is oak forest. This is actually a new house, garage, guest house. Um, and this brighter green is the sort of domestic world um, that was based, they really wanted us to base it kind of on a farm aesthetic because this is the North Fork which still has a very um, rural agricultural life. So, but this is the bluff. So I we sort of need to focus on that. And then um, there are two ravines that run right through the site. And then the meadow um, runs from the upper area down almost to the beach. And then this is all beach. So it's Understanding the landscape types like this is really important. So this is looking up at the meadow and it's quite minimal. Um, we've talked a little bit about scale. There was, this is about 15 acres, but about four acres of developed area. And so it was of, of an ample scale just to do these kind of wide swaths that take you through the landscape and make you feel that it's actually pretty big. 
and looking, um, this is right, perched on the edge of the bluff. So these are mostly oaks. And we planted a lot of huckleberry and um, blueberry and a lot of things that normally grow on the bluff and um, baccarus and plants you probably would recognize. Uh, but this is in one of the ravines. And so I put the swimming pool working with DEC. So we weren't doing anything really terrible up at the top of the ravine so that you actually feel like you're moving out toward the water. Um, and one of the things that I did here, which was um, to actually plant in a gap between this deck, these are all the kinds of plants that you would find in the ravine. So even in the more uh, orchestrated landscapes, having that feel of a ravine come into the cracks and the places where the plantings come through. And then this is the more domestic landscape and this is really based on kind of farm. This is um, a little farm courtyard uh, with, uh, I found on eBay, a pig trough on the right hand side for their uh, herb garden. And then the paving that takes you sort of through the farm court. Um, so then I just wanted to talk about the nonprofit that I started um, about six years ago that really has only started to take off in the last year or two, uh, because it, it has really sp sort of spilled back into my work doing landscape design. Um, it was started to try to visualize the landscapes. For instance, I was looking at Greenwich, you know, you have such amazing um, natural areas, forest, uh, coast and how do you actually visualize these as a larger landscape? Uh, you know, quite often people in my profession keep things a little bit secret and they'll do GIS and they'll do all these plans that look like science. And I really wanted to start to look at these places in ways that just lay people can understand. So I'm using my, my landscape of um, the end of Long Island, all of the um, beaches, the walking dunes uh, and, and you know, this incredible blasted kind of landscape. Um, and uh, the wetlands also, and then also the little settlements around that are really, really important kind of cultural places. And how do you actually look at them all as one whole? So the nonprofit is called One Landscape because it's like trying to look at these landscapes as one landscape and not as little, you know, if you looked at who owns it, it's like eight different agencies, municipalities, parks own the different pieces of it and private owners. Uh, these are the dune lands. Um, and then you have Akabana Harbor, which is such an incredible spot, um, uh, just at the sort of bowl at Nepeg. So this is what we're taking is we're taking the aerials and this is like just a Google Earth aerial and then trying to really draw over them to really bring out so that you can see that this is wetland, you can see that this is farmland, you can see that this is beach. It's very subtle, uh, but it actually, when people have seen this out there, they're kind of have been really shocked because they haven't seen how rich this landscape is in one piece before. And they said, why, why haven't people done this before? And I, I have no idea. <laughs> I think people, I, I'm sort of surprised. So this is what I was talking about. The, um, this is looking at the geology and then also where the land is four feet or lower. So you start, instead of having all the layers all separate the way, I don't know, if those of you know, the McCargian kind of method or GIS where you have to look at layers, I'm trying to meld these things together so you really understand the landscape. And when you have a house, you can understand that your landscape is part of this bigger landscape, whether you're buying something new or whether you've lived there forever. But you, once you do this, you can't divorce your own little place from this bigger framework. So this is looking at the Peconic Estuary. Um, and this is our site right here. Can you all see my cursor? Um, so this is Nepeg right here. And the reason that it's one, uh, a, a good test study is because it's one of the two places in the estuary where the estuary actually meets the Atlantic and Long Island Sound. So, um, and that's because the, the bedrock dipped down really low or just disappeared so that the water actually flowed over the land. And the, the name Nepeg actually means water flowing over land in Montauket. Um, so this is just showing you the geology. This is actually the limit of the, the sort of what people say is the limit. It's sort of made up, but the limit of the, you know, it's the high point, the limit of the estuary. Um, and then, you know, the really saturated infused areas and you sort of don't conceive of this landscape if you start to think of it as 
you know, Sag Harbor and North Haven and all these places. I don't know if you know all these places, but you don't conceive of them as part of this big, big estuary. So that's kind of the whole purpose of this. So when I was going to be talking with you all, I started to look at Greenwich and I couldn't find that much information. There's not, um, you know, people haven't done this kind of mapping. I, I don't know if you all know who Megan Goldman is, but she was at Williams College in 2014 and did a really wonderful um, study of the geology of Connecticut. And this is where you start to understand, you know, all of the, the valleys and all of the ways in which the, the bedrock kind of smushed together. And you can see, you know, in the Greenwich area that it is pretty varied. So that's the kind of research that, that goes into this sort of mapping. And then this is a map from, uh, it's from 1939, but it's supposed to be of, you know, during the revolution, what Greenwich looked like. And what's so interesting is how developed it looks, you know, it's farms and probably it was cleared, right? If, you know, during the revolution, it was probably mostly cleared for ships and other things. Um, and then on the right-hand side from 1856, you start to see the geology a little bit and, and, the, and the coast. So it's just, to me, it's very interesting how people, um, represent the landscape over the years. This is actually, uh, I can't remember when it's from, like turn of the century of, of uh, quarries. So this is the economic map of Connecticut, looking at where um, you actually would get the most material, uh, stone material. And what I was interested in why the corner of Greenwich was not thought of as potentially quarried. So, cause when you look, it's got a lot of amazing rock. Um, and this, so the scientists and the artists and everything often will just uh, like split. And so this is by um, Yukon Forestry. And you can see here how the entire area of Greenwich is thought of as developed, which I think is just not accurate. You know, if you actually really took a finer grain, you would look at how much um, you have in terms of forests, in terms of rivers and, and, and really uh, active uh, ecosystems. And then this one was just interesting about, you know, the social and cultural map. Uh, so then, uh, you know, I was looking at the huge range you have. And I think um, Diane was saying that you're doing a, a plan, a conservation plan. And I do think a mapping exercise would be really wonderful to say, how do you really express to people what an incredible uh, wealth of landscape you have. Um, but also in the kind of, suburban or whatever, um, uh, you know, sort of habit, you look at the larger landscape and you have a lot of forest and it's all woven through people's landscapes. I was looking at this, which also is of a scale. This is whatever, Petit Trianor. It's of a scale that's kind of appropriate for a French landscape. You know, you have this huge forest behind you, um, but you know, as with French landscapes, you're always looking at it in relation to the larger landscape and to the wild landscape. It was all, you know, the Loire River Valley was all about, you know, this huge floodplain. And it was always in, in your eye when you were looking at the much more organized, architecturalized landscape. So, and then, you know, you look at something like, uh, you know, our traditions, garden traditions of Mount Vernon, for instance, where you had the you know, Bowling Green that you entered, and then you went through the wildernesses on the sides. There was always this idea that you could go, uh, you could go through a wilderness and then arrive at the more formal gardens. Um, it was repeated over and over after Washington. Um, but, you know, I, I see that in some of the, like this one, I don't know whose house this is, but I thought this was really interesting because, you know, so you see the huge gardens, but you also see so much forest weaving through and a scale, you know, I, is that like a Jeff Koons puppy there? Um, you know, it's the appropriate scale. I mean, it's in a huge open space. And I just feel like there is something at work with this kind of landscape that you don't have to say you have either or. You can say, how do you make a hybrid that really operates on a couple of different levels? So um, one of the lessons in all of this is just to take your time um, on and, and in terms of management, you know, it's not just about design and, and what happens in the first year. I would say it's, it's how do you gradually over time that previous landscape looked like something that was developed over time. It's not all done in one fell swoop, 
but making sure that you really have control where you really want control and then you let things go where it's okay to let them go so this is a this is like that project in Greenwich an 18 acre project in Watermill that was a potato field and in the kind of what is it exercise um I kind of ended up figuring that it was kind of like a park you know when you're at that scale you really are designing a park even um if it has gardens so it has pot I, I really wanted because it was flat 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 potato field and I the program was so intense they wanted a pond they wanted a swimming pool they wanted a hill and all stuff that I just decided that I would really mess with the um topography a lot so I made a pond that actually drops three feet from one level to another and then another big pond sunken garden this is actually to the lower level of the house um and because we had too much program <laughs> not too much but uh they wanted a pond and a swimming pool I decided if you float the swimming pool in the pond you don't have to have a fence around it you just have to have a gates and so it kind of um allows you to uh collapse these things into into one um and so when I say park, it is all about how you flow through the spaces and, you know, open up and then go through the more enclosed spaces. Um, this is actually looking out at the orchard um, from the house. But if you back up, um, this is the herb garden that is right outside uh, their house. So there's a kind of a graduation from the berry uh, garden to intermediate, sort of more park-like and then really wild. And um, that takes a lot of kind of calibration, I guess. So this is the vegetable garden. Um, and, you know, the vegetable gardens are really the um, closest to the kitchen, closest to the house. They are, make sense. Uh, and then even this is a spillway from one level of the pond to another. Um, so when you're looking at it toward the house, it actually looks quite garden-like. Garden but then when you're looking at it in the other direction, it looks kind of wild. So even the graduation from one level to another out into the landscape is very carefully done. This is a fire pit out near the upper pond, um, getting to the a little wilder. And then the whole framework of it is meadows. And we didn't actually create these meadows. This was um, actually seeded with lawn. And then we, in, in like, I've been working on this since 19, since uh, for about 20, over 20 years, but we've been um, uh, gradually just doing a mowing plan as I did with my house so that we let areas tur turn to meadow and you don't have to do that for let, you know, getting a meadow to grow is a huge amount of work. So it's a much lazy person's way of making a meadow is just to stop mowing <laughs> and monitor it and you can plug with new things. Um, so this is the larger framework. and just in terms of the drawings, always going back to the larger. So this is a drone. Um, so we use drones a lot so that we can actually really be very exact. Um, and then this is the larger framework where the sort of pink is more farm-like and then um, the purple is more understory. And then, uh, you know, the wilder stuff is all on the edges. So as I was saying, it's a little unconventional in terms of being like landscape plan, but it's actually really workable because we're walking <laughs> these paths and documenting them and making it from what actually is on the ground. So it's not imposing the plan from above. It's actually growing it a little bit more organically. Um, and it's, it's a working document. We're using it all the time. We're doing a little nut and tree farm up at the top now. Um, so one of the things that I talk to students all the time about <laughs> and clients is that we often design with our feet. So this, these two drawings are paths through all the meadow and different ways that we were trying to create the paths, walking it, documenting it um, until it feels right. So that is something that you can draw it, but until you've really walked it with the mower and with the, you know, like your flags and everything, um, it's, uh, it's not going to feel settled um, and really right so this kind of you know the path gets really narrow and then it broadens out and that's all done in the field so this is what it looked like in 2000 or 1999 um, it was a potato field and then this is what it looked like in the phase one so this is the first pond 
and the swimming pool and the pond and the tennis court and the sunken garden. And this is the beginning of the orchard. And then this is what it looks like now. So this has taken 20 years to develop. And if you look at it, it's a little weird. There's a house, there's a, a cookhouse, a building that's supposed to go here, which is why um, all of this was designed on the ground so that you would have a really big sense of distance um, and so that you would never see the hole so that it would always feel um, a little bigger. So it takes a lot of uh, walking and, and uh, looking to do this kind of thing. And now, you know, 20 years later, it does feel like it's always been there. I always, I, I used to, um, my projects all look different because I'm really letting them grow out of the different sort of conditions. And then also, I love it when projects look like they've always been there. And that used to be a liability. People are like, well, you know, people wanted more flashy design, but now I think people have come along a little bit and are um, interested in having places that are just for them. And it's not about having, um, you know, cutting edge design right up uh, in your in your house landscape every day, although that has its place. And I really, really admire the people who do it really well. But you can see that all the plantings and everything have really come in and it really does feel as if it's um, believable, <laughs> is what I would say. Uh, and then just the last couple of projects, this, was a pro this is about what is it? This is a project where I was asked to do a garden um, this is the existing garden looking out at Biscayne Bay and Miami Beach. And I just thought if, if I design a garden here, um, it's gonna look ridiculous because the scale of the bay is so huge. And then the Miami um, skyline. So I said, let's just take the whole thing out and make the whole thing water so that you, and that's kind of what we did. So that you really feel like you're part of the bay and you feel like the bay is and it has a swimming pool and it has gardens and stuff, but the main thing is to really feel as if you are out in the water. And, um, but, you know, always sort of turning inward that there are places to be and places to hang out, but that you're always kind of being sent back out to the water. Um, and this one, it was funny, I thought it was about water, but it's really, really about sky. I mean, the sky is incredible in this, um, you know, mesmerizing. Um, so getting back to the, what is it for, um, so that's sort of like how to make, you know, that was kind of sublime. Sometimes our projects are just dealing with problems. Um, and this one is really dealing with a problem in the Hudson Highlands. I don't know if you all know the Hudson Highlands are fjords, very, very steep cliffs. Um, and, uh, so this is, um, a site this is looking at the Adirondacks and the Hudson Islands go across the river and it's very, very like folded. I'm gonna go pretty quickly through this. If you look at this, the landscape is kind of folded. So a lot of the houses are kind of nestled into these little forested folds. So it's almost like claustrophobic. Like you, you a little farther north, you start to open to farmland. And this was the site before we actually started to work on it. Everything is very linear. Um, and so you see here, this is, um, the road, the hill, uh, a little stream, and everything is very linear. And so my, and then the house was like that. And the, you know, it was, it, it all felt like it was sort of shoved into this little fold. So the whole job here was to push everything out and to make a believable landscape that um, wasn't just about lining up near the house, near the road. Near. So this is just showing how we kind of pushed it all out. And made a diagonal down of a of a walkway, um, a kind of a boardwalk. So they're much more, the movement is much more diagonal and it's not just making everything and then and then pushing out to this little sitting area. Um, so making these spaces really uh, make a much more lateral kind of a space and not just slivers in the landscape. So this is, it was just finished this spring. So this is pretty new planting, but this is that diagonal boardwalk over um, a stream. They really wanted a stream. I wouldn't have made a stream, but they really wanted a stream and I really like it so now, but it's um, completely artificial. But um, these lower plantings are all in sort of wet areas with ferns and other um, lots of uh, more things that like moist and the 
um, you know, bald cypress. So this is such a different kind of landscape from what you've seen in other projects. But to me, doing this in the highlands where it's very craggy and, and very rough, uh, it needed this kind of roughness. Um, and also, uh, you know, using a lot of boulders um, and uh, really making a forest that feels like it, I mean, you can see kind of how um, completely ratty this was. <laughs> was really um and so we made it made the whole thing up but now the birds and the frogs and everything are incredible there so this was actually a really fun project to work on that started with a problem a lot of the projects start with a problem um and you can see here how these are sort of pushing out that landscape and uh this is Stephen Harris's own house up upstate and my problem with it was that everything um there was no place to be aside from near the house and everything kind of graded off so I made this little aspen grove. So this is my little, um, in a completely artificial, he's very, very architectural. Um, how do you actually create a little place? So I made this little aspen grove that now is his partner's favorite place to be because you're sitting there and you hear the crickets and everything. So in this very highly controlled landscape, how do you create a place that is gonna have a life of its own? And the meadow actually goes seems to go almost right through the house at one at one area and that was another thing that we did to uh bring the sort of wilder landscape into the domestic world and you know carving the stairs into the meadow um but you know allowing for the mess in this little aspen grove was um a huge huge thing and Stephen didn't like it at first and now he really likes it when he sort of got to see what it does for the place um, I'm going to skip over this because I think that we're kind of getting short in time. And this is a project in India, but just to show you, um, just to show you uh, that on any project, this is about conservation and doing all sorts of permaculture to do reforestation. We reforested a lot of this. Um, this is before and after. So it was a huge restoration project. And I do think that for your conservation efforts, understanding how much you can do is really important because this, who knew that we could actually turn this whole thing into a forest within 10 years. Um, and uh, so this is all reforestation that you're looking out at, but just to um, look at how each part of this grew out of the very different conditions, out of the ravine, out of the valley floor, out of the, the main water, the Nala, the main water. So it's like a lot of the other projects that you've seen, but it's this is a 3,500 acre retreat uh, resort and institute. So um, a lot of the operations are the same, um, just allowing the landscape and architecture to grow out of the very particular conditions. So, you know, the forest suites, we actually grew the forest to build the suites and um, the pool is kind of tucked into a mountain. And then I, I like this because it shows the new landscape in the front, which is gardened. And then in the middle is all the reforestation and above is just what was existing, but you don't see the clear boundaries between them. And that's just something that I like to do. So then finally, this is just my house in Amagansett. Um, just looking at uh, how, if you look at these larger issues, like, um, you know, reforestation and, uh, you know, water quality, uh, that you can actually look at making your own places for living within that. I mean, just like when I was looking at those big houses in Greenwich, there, you know, there are ways in which you can actually marry all of these and not have them be uh, contradictory. So uh, this landscape in Amagansett is, um, a, you know, it's kind of like a little community hub because I've been there my whole life. Uh, and it is part of the estuary. It's very much building on the coastal wash um, all of those plants are the plants that you find in that sort of very, very fine, uh, shallow, sandy um, matrix, and then literally on the dune. And it's all there, but it actually is also a place for us to live. So I think that kind of getting your head working on two levels, and this is just looking at um, the kind of gardening part of it. And I, I love yuccas. Yuccas were very out of fashion for a long time, um, but looking at the things that really will do in this really, really harsh climb it's very hard to get things to grow right on the beach um and and um you know how do you tuck living spaces into for instance the pines um and the uh, huge that that 
uh, beach plum just seeded in by itself maybe 20 years ago. And, you know, using the pine needles and other things to have it feel very much of the dune. And, um, you know, all of the materials are kind of carefully chosen to be, feel like they're part of this landscape. And, you know, so you have these living spaces, but you also have this landscape that flows from the front, which is sort of like the back dune up um, over the dune and out to the ocean. So it is always connecting you like the place in Cabo and Baja California, always connecting you both to the ocean and also to the back dune. And that's it. And that, I mean, really the last thing I just, that that it's it's home for me, but it's also home for all of the birds and creatures that um, live there. So just thinking of it as a more domestic landscape in terms of the ecology as well uh, is helpful. And I think that's it. Thank you very much, uh, Margie. And uh, I think we have a couple of uh, questions. Let me just go into the chat room here and see. Uh, okay, how, how do you keep invasives from coming in when you let things go a bit more wild? That's the best question. Um, it's, <laughs> it's, uh, that's what I said about managing. So we're constantly managing invasives. And I don't know if you, um, there are all sorts of like flushes of invasives, like they'll just come in one year. So last year it was clover, which I've never seen taking over like this. Mm -hmm. and normally we will uh, be able to manage it just by hand removing, for instance. Uh, we don't like to use pest, you know, like Roundup or anything, but um, in this case we had to steam the clover. So we actually had to kill uh, some of the other plants, but the clover. But if you just wait it out, sometimes, like the clover actually had this huge blush, and now a lot of the plants that we planted are shading it out. So if you, so we kind of did a hybrid of getting rid of it in the worst areas, and then it's actually kind of um, starting to wane in some of the others. But things like stilt grass. Mm. Uh, so in my little reforestation project in Philadelphia, it was all going really well until I had this massive uh, bloom of stilt grass and I had to pull it all out. And that's when I planted the asters and other things. So quite often you'll have to pull it all out and plant something else. So it's a lot, it's a lot of ma maintenance and management. Yeah. So it's not just a free for all is what you're saying. <laughs> no, never. And, and yeah. And, and when I say let things go, it's just to look more like they've been let go. However, you're always, and you know, things like panicum, which is a great plant on the project in watermill. And it's just take, it's just like turned into this. So a lot of these plants like very poor soil. So if you plant them in 10 feet of loam, they turn almost, you know, bionic. So the panicum, which normally would be about, you know, three feet high is like six feet high. So you just, that's why I'm saying you're constantly art directing and moving things around. But, you know, hopefully like with the project, that project in Watermill, we've only had one big bloom of, um, it was on the project in the North Fork that had the clover. The project in Watermill had mugwort and we just hand, we just had um, the guys remove it by hand and it worked. Uh, so, that one has more of a, because I think it's been established for so long, that's, you know, about a bit of process of 20 years, but the project in Watermill was brand new. So I just think understanding that the first four, five years, you're going to have a lot of that, um, things just coming in and having to manage a lot more. And then hopefully it will have, it, you know, find its own level eventually. When you did your house in Philadelphia, I was just thinking back on that. Um, how did you select which plants you were going to do in the front yard? Is it I did. <laughs> it just came in. I mean, I remember the wild cherries. You mentioned that. Yeah. Yeah. So black cherries came in on one side, and then ornamental cherries started to come in in the middle, and then the weeping cherry came in on the side, and then I planted asters yeah. underneath. When that was because of the still grass. Yeah. And I planted oak leaf hydrangea because it's deer resistant and very, very hardy. 
and I planted hellebores. Mm -hmm. I did plant some things, but it basically was, um, the reason I planted the asters and the oak leaf hydrangea was partly because my neighbors were so upset. And so I wanted to make it look a little bit better. Um, but then also it really helped with the still grass doing the under, you know, under planting with yeah. shade. Does anyone else have any questions that, uh, for uh, Maggie? No? Um, well, I, first of all, I wanna thank you very much. Uh, and it was really beautiful. Um, it really opened, I think, a lot of our eyes to, like you were saying, the one landscape kind of concept um, to be right. more inclusive in, in the view. And, um, but I, I, I loved your comment also about Olmsted uh, leading you to, on a path and then you, it opens up. I mean, we just had a lecture the other, a couple of weeks ago on Olmsted's design theories in, at Central Park. So your, your oh, concept, right. yeah. So that, that was very interesting from your standpoint as well, doing that. Well, appreciate that. And again, um, your book was uh, basically Wild by Design Strategies for Creating Life-Enhancing Landscapes. I suggest that everyone take a look at the book and has more meat in it and has wonderful chapters on some of the design concepts that you were discussing today. And really appreciate that. Thanks again. And, and uh, good luck with your um, conservation plan. Yes, and, the town is, uh, the town is uh, discussing. I mean, there are some issues that are being brought up um, and that has to do with the question of uh, public land areas and uh, swap offs. So uh, I think that's, that's always it. That's the same with that peak. It's always it. So yeah. good luck. Yeah. Good. Well, again, Great. thanks and Thank hope you're you feeling so better. Thank you. Appreciate okay. it. Take All care. Right. Bye -bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.